Welcome to what happened on Saturday with Marlon Kerner. And Marlon, I feel like the title to our show has never been more apropos than today. Uh, ever since Saturday at about 3.15, 3.30, uh, I've, been looking, I've been looking forward to talking to you uh, about what actually did happen last Saturday. We just got the college football rankings for people that are, that are joining us here on Wednesday. A little bit of a surprise and some silver lining for your Buckeyes. Let's go backwards, though. Talk me through uh, your Saturday, uh, the game, um, and then I'll, I'll share some thoughts with you about what my observations were and my observations of watching it with you by text. I, I enjoyed, <laughs> once again, I enjoy when you are more of a fan than a level-headed former player. I, I get a kick out of that. So the floor is yours, my friend. First of all, I'm in all black because I'm mourning my loss. Uh, my Saturday and Sunday, uh, it was just a rough, rough football weekend for me. Uh, my Buckeyes lost, our Bills lost, uh, and then I had to change my avatar based off mm. of a bet with Jay Ramersma to that team up north logo. Uh, and, and the crazy part about that is before I even get into the game, Jay sent me a picture and I was like, it won't fit. He sent me the M. And I'm like, <laughs> it won't fit. So I literally had to go find oh. a Michigan background that would fit on Twitter so that it would look right. And so I had to I had to go search and find all. So it was just like just and now it's in your it's in your, in your, it's, just it's in yes. your Google searches now. Now it's and I get your, searched like, now like, hey, how about another U of M football? I don't care about U of M football. I could care <laughs> less. I don't want that logo. But yeah, it was just one of those crazy things. Uh and we were texting it and 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 we talked about it earlier in the week and in our first episode is there was a lot of hype, a lot of noise surrounding this game. Did Michigan cheat? Did they not cheat? Stallions that should Harbaugh be suspended? Should he not be suspended? Michigan versus everybody's shirts, all those things. But I think we talked for maybe two minutes where we talked about all those things aside, there's a game that has to be played on Saturday. And it's going to look bad. And the series, if the guy who's been there for so many years loses to the interim head coach, uh, mm -hmm. and sure, the, the 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 interim head coach right now, his resume is looking really good. He beat the number two team in the country. He's undefeated right now. He's definitely executing and getting his team playing at a high level. Uh, and and that was like that was one of the first storylines that played in there. Uh, they executed. They played well, uh, even without Harbaugh there. And I don't know if they play differently, if Harbaugh's there or not. We'll never know. But I was definitely impressed in how the intensity, no matter what happened, uh, they stayed focused. They still brought the intensity the entire game. So you have to give kudos to Michigan and how they played. And, and then I want to make sure I give kudos to Jay Reimersma. If you didn't hear our bonus episode that we aired Saturday morning before the game, he, nailed it. he, he nailed kind it. of talked about his experience. But more importantly, he talked about what he wanted to see Michigan do and execute in this game. And one of those things he talked about was using the tight end more, really going after and exploiting the matchups. He thought that Michigan's tight end had a, had an advantage against our linebackers and covered the way we like to play a lot of zone with cover, with cover two safeties behind that. He thought there would be some gaps they could run in. He wanted to know what would it look like if we lined up man to man. He thought their tight end Loveland, I think that's his last name. Colton, Loveland. Colton um, Loveland. Yep. Loveland would have a, um, an advantage with his size. And, his, he, and and I agree, he had the size. And he ran a lot better and was a lot faster than what I thought and anticipated he was going to be. He ran away from some of our safeties. He definitely had the advantage against our linebackers. So it was kind of crazy going into this game. I'm thinking of all those things. And then you think, like, throw it out the window. It's a rivalry game. And and I was like, okay, well, how's this going to come back? Because we're And I even texted you, like, hey, we're a better second-half team. Mm -hmm. But I thought there were some mismanagements where – you run out the clock. You still have a timeout to go for a long field goal. I thought, again, when we talk about Ohio State and some of the things they like to do, they like to play it safe. In this game, you can't play it safe. You have to try to go in and score points because field goals aren't going to win the game for you. Uh, you have to score touchdowns. And so I thought Ohio State could have been a little bit more aggressive there, maybe tried to pick up an extra five, six yards and maybe make that a 48-yarder. Maybe if you can pick up a first down, clock's going to stop. You have a little bit of time. You have a timeout in your back pocket. So you have some time to be – you can execute and try to call a play and stop the clock and get yourself in a better position. It proved to be five more yards would have helped. I, I think when you look sure. at that kick, five more yards would have helped, made it a little bit more manageable kick, maybe made the kicker not have to think about it a little bit. I've got to get into this and really lay into this kick. 
you know, he definitely probably felt more comfortable kicking a 49, maybe a 48 yard field goal. So I thought that was one of the things. The first turnover. I mean, we look at that like it's a it's a it's an RPO. You have to come off that read. Like it, it was almost like McCourt just said, I'm I'm a, I'm a pull this and I'm gonna throw to Marvin. Now there's a couple things, and, and I'm not gonna sit up here and argue on whether uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. gave enough effort. Really, he thought the ball wasn't coming his way. Like in a big scheme of things, he's I'm running a slant. Will Johnson jumped it. He was right in the middle. There's no way this ball is going to be completed. And McCord threw the ball anyway. Yeah, you could argue on should he have given more effort, try to make the tackle or, or whatever. I'm not going to debate that. It's just the game is over. And and as we look at and I'll pull up some stats because it was just kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, Michigan, the game came down to who could protect the ball. You know, uh, and and who could convert on third and fourth down? Because that's where it's going to come down. I thought Ohio State did a better job com- converting, and the stats show that on fourth da- on third down, Ohio State was able to finish drives. They really made Michigan do a lot of punting. But when they came down to really being aggressive, when they had to, when they really said we we're going to extend a drive, in particular in that fourth quarter when they went on that that, that seven minute drive to really eat up the clock, that was the difference. They they went for it on fourth down and they executed in Ohio State. We didn't go for it on fourth down. And then we turned the ball over. We turned the ball over early, which led to a Michigan touchdown. And then we turned the ball over late, which ended the game. And that was really the biggest key. I thought we ran the ball decently. Michigan ran the ball better. I thought we we passed the ball. Again, Marvin Harrison Jr. only had, what, eight or nine targets that game? You've got to find a way to target him more when he is your best offensive playmaker. You've got to scheme better. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, this came down to a rivalry. Uh, and when it when when you look at the rivalry games, you can throw all this stuff out the window. It came down to Michigan being more physical. Um, they they dominated the line of scrimmage when they needed to. They were able to knock our defensive line back and run the ball. Uh, and and we could, we talk about being sound gap wise. They popped the twenty two yarder. Uh, and and it was just all those little things of where you got to be gap sound. We jump the gap. They pop it. There Blake Corm sees it. He pops it. He runs for a touchdown. Just we made too many mental errors in crucial moments and we didn't execute at the highest level uh, and, and on that last play I, I i just shook my head because i'm sitting there like dude you predetermined you were going to marvin now i will say when you look at the replay if he had time that's a big completion because he had he had the gap so i understand what he was reading but then you also have to understand like okay if i need to get the ball out quickly you got a guy in the flat you can throw the ball to and you live to fight another ga- another down. You had a guy to the left flat you could have thrown yeah. to. So you had yep. other options you could check down to. And it was just kind of like, he's like, I've got to make this play it, 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 as me when I'm watching it. That's how it felt like. And I'm sure the fan base was the same. Like, dude, just throw the check down. You see the rush come and attack. The tackle didn't, he didn't, he didn't hold up or the guard didn't hold up, right? Okay, you got pressure in your face. Check down. You can throw the check down. If you throw the check down, the ball's going to end up in the dirt. And we're going to f- line up and fight again. And now you have another chance to find Marvin Harrison Jr., Again, we came up short three years in a row, and I'm not going to sit up here and argue and say they should or, or, or go into some of the Twitter back because it was just it was fun to read Twitter. After I'm not going to lie, it was just fun to read the comments and and is this team having a fight and and this this and that and and all those things and do they care about it? That that is I'll let Twitter fight that battle. I'm not going to fight that battle. Somebody who who played in the series. Um, and didn't have a winning record against Michigan. I'm in no position to sit up here and tell somebody, especially former players that are three and three and one or four and zero against against Michigan, how how that team should play. I will say, Twitter can fight it out, but I thought I thought they fought hard. They just came up a little short, and it was disappointing because you needed this game to kind of say, okay, we can turn the tide. Like right now, there's a huge mental block, and now you you may or may not have Marvin Harrison Jr. back next year. I don't even know if McCord's going to be your guy. What are you going to do if you're going to bring in and go to the portal and find a, a, a more poised quarterback, maybe somebody who's more polished than what McCord is. But it's going to be really interesting to see what it looks like. If they, This is the type of game that can end your career if you're a head coach at Ohio State. So we don't even know what it's going to look like after it all shakes down and 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 all the games played out this, this weekend. Um, and if Ohio State gets into the college football playoff, I don't think they get in, by the way. Um, if they get in or don't get in – you could be looking at you could possibly look at the last game that Ryan Day played against Michigan. Uh, and so it's it's a lot that's going to happen um, that we don't know how it's going to play out and what the board is thinking about. But these are the type of games and situations that can end your career uh, as a head coach at Ohio State. Did you um, did you at any point feel like the Buckeyes were going to win that game? Because I didn't. 
I thought after the third quarter, I'm like, okay, I, I, we have a really good chance. The way they played, I said, if they can play like this and really shut down that run and get Michigan to punt, uh, then I thought we had a really good chance. When when Michigan kind of went up, I was like, okay, we're going to come back. And it was a nice little back and forth battle in that third and early fourth quarter. Where I thought we were going to really be in trouble was if it came down to we had to rely on Cal McCord uh, yeah. to make a throw. I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to execute like he did in that Notre Dame game. Well, and, 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 the, and the Michigan guy run. didn't drop the pick. <laughs> yeah, he didn't drop the pick. And I, but I didn't think that Michigan would give him the same looks, right? Like Notre Dame kind of said, we're going to be aggressive. We're going to give you some one-on-ones. I was like, there's no way Michigan's going to do that. They're going to say, we're going to make you throw it. So either you find the seam, and if you beat, if you make a great throw and Marvin catches it, so be it. But they were like, they were saying, take the check down. We dare you to try to throw it and fit it here because we have all these people dropping around where where, where you like to get Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, in, in those route trees and route combinations. And they were pretty much saying, I dare you to throw it to the flat. Let's see if he can make somebody miss and get out of bounds. And they were daring him to do that. And he, he decided he was going to take the in route that their defensive line made a good play and beat our guy. I mean, from the onset, he beat him. Uh, and yeah. so, okay. So he didn't really have that much time to really make set his feet and get the throw off. So I get, I get that part. That was the first loss, but once they wanted that long drive, I was like, you know what? They, they went for it on fourth down. They did a whole lot of things where they just extended that drive and eight at the clock. And you knew they weren't really trying to score a touchdown. They were just like, if we can kick a field goal, now we make you have to score a touchdown to win and beat us. And I was like, I don't know if he can do that. I don't know if he has enough composure and enough experience, really. Because that's the main thing is experience breeds composure in those situations. If you've been there before and you understand, okay, pressure's coming quick. I got to get to my check down because I know my check down is. This is one, This is his first game as a starter. I was like, I don't know if he has enough experience throughout the regular season to give him enough composure in this type of game, in this environment where you've been hearing all year long, you're not good enough. You shouldn't be the quarterback here. Fans are clamoring for why don't you bench him and put somebody else in like all year long. So he's, re- you know, you can tell he's th- that that's an emotional toll that that's been taken on him. And he's going to try to prove everybody wrong and, and have one of the best games of his career. And I didn't think he threw the ball well, except for the first interception. Like he threw the ball pretty decently. He skipped some balls, but he had done it all season long. I thought he made good decisions after that interception. And then he just got hit on the last play. But we can sit up here and dissect this all day. At the end of the day, I mean, Michigan, they they made plays. They ran, they yeah. ran the ball well. They 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 called great plays and 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 things that you like, hey, they hadn't shown that all year. They got they did things to get their their, their, their I, come on, halfback pass. <laughs> halfback yeah, pass. Right, like, right, right. I'm like, that's a it. great call. I'm sitting there like was, that is a great call. Like that's fantastic. something they hadn't shown all year long. And you when you think about how houses, like they're gonna try to run the ball, they're gonna try to pound the ball down our throat. Uh, you know, I'm gonna run a halfback pass and our and the coverage linebacker safety. Blew the coverage. Hey, turn him loose. Like, hey, that's my, we're playing man to man coverage. Everyone came up. I'm gonna turn him loose, and all of a sudden, big gain running through the secondary. They get him down, but it extends the drive. Now you got another three downs that you can eat up more time off the clock, and it put them one step closer to kicking a makeable field goal. I thought they did a really good job of getting themselves in makeable scoring situations where it wasn't going to be a strain on their field goal kicker if they needed to take the three. And when they had to score touchdowns. They scored touchdowns. I mean, think about the first the, the first touchdown or the second touchdown they had. He threads the ball between a running corner that was playing man-to-man coverage and a and a safety slash or a hybrid corner slash safety playing in that little that that spot right there where he turns run instead of if he stays square, it's an interception. If he just gets depth, what you're taught in, in some of those coverages, like hey, you've got the eyes on the quarterback, you know there's a cross route coming. Be at this depth, get at 15 yards, get at 13 yards where you don't have to turn and run. If you come up a little shallow, your first inclination is to turn and run to try to help. He has to turn and run thinking he's going to help and make that play. He thread, I mean, threads the ball. I mean, you can't get a smaller window than that. And he put it in there and it's a great catch. And I'm not going to argue on whether it was an interception or whether the ball was moving. When you're at Michigan, you're going to get that call. That's a touchdown yeah. all day. Same thing if you're in Ohio State. It's a, if, if it's reversed and it's at, at Ohio Stadium, we're going to get the call. It's a, They're going to overturn it. It's an interception. So that's the benefit of being at home. That's the benefit of being in these series. I mean, we can go back years ago when it's Curtis Samuel and everybody's like, he got stopped on fourth down mm-hmm. and he does it. They, like, no, it's, it, we're at home. We're going to get that call. Same thing. Michigan's going to get that call. So I don't argue on whether we should have. you got to do something better to make a stop. Uh, as a defense and a heck of a throw. So I give them kudos on that. But I thought they just played with a little bit more moxie. It, it's, when I watched it, I was like, they were looser, right? 
they were they loser. wanted the game more. They wanted it they more. Did. Like they had yeah. more intensity, more fire. They wanted the game. They wanted to win this game more. I feel like, you know, being the neutral observer that I am, I feel like Ohio State takes on, you know, the the the, the attitude of their head coach and right. they play kind of tight, right? Like he's so high strung. And I mean, clearly he wants, he wants to win, of course, but, but he's just tense, you know, and, and, yeah. and without Harbaugh there, it almost seemed like they were playing looser. Like you said, the halfback pass, like just, just go out and play, sling the ball around, you know, not that there wasn't pressure on them. Of course there was, but Ohio state just seemed really tense, especially in the beginning yeah. and got down and, you know, they're just, they're just like it's so high strung. And, and I wanted to ask you, you know, you obviously been around this program for 30 years. Your head coach is 56 and seven. Okay. And right. he's 0 and 3 against Michigan, of course. I understand all that. But man, if those are the expectations, like, does, does any season ever have any joy if you're an Ohio State Buckeye? If you don't beat Michigan, like, you know, you're 11 and 1. And, and, and again, you, you went to Notre Dame and won. You dominated Penn State. Of course, you didn't get the outcome that you wanted. But man, what a like almost like what a what a what a tough existence as a fan or an alumni or a former player or as a current player or as a coach if the only standard with a new quarterback your 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 best shot to win that game is if CJ Stroud is still on your team. Absolutely. You know, you've got you've got a new quarterback, you run the table, you had an amazing win in, in South Bend, and now the season's not only just a calamity but the head coach needs to go. The quarterback needs to go. Like, I don't know. I, I just like, what's the upside here? I, I, you bring up a great point. I think that is kind of the standard that I'm not going to say that's the standard that the university measures everybody by and measures head coaches and their performance by. But that's what the fan base has now come to expect because you've had some success. Uh, and I grew up coming, looking at Earl Bruce uh, and grew up. I'm looking at Coach Cooper. So I understand what it was like. And I was a part of that Coach Cooper era. So I understand how the fan base felt. Uh, and and it wasn't that it wasn't that a lack of effort or anything like that. Um, and again, I don't think that those guys didn't have a lack of effort on on Saturday or, or the previous two uh, two losses against Michigan. It's just sometimes things happen and you can't put a finger, put your finger on it. But you're right. Like if you, if you decide as as an as a university uh, and as a board of trustees to come in and say we're, we're going to relieve Ryan Davis, which is, who do you get? Like who else yeah. do you get to come in? You, th there's there's a time when it's just sometimes you lose to a team that's they were evenly matched. I thought there were plenty. Like when you look at the years when Urban went seven and zero and Jim Trestle went seven and zero or six and zero, like you had uh, just they had more talent on 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 Ohio State side. I, I think. This is one of the, the first times where I, I could say and argue that Michigan top talent was equal on both sides. Like you could match up talent for talent. Uh, you you might give the nod to say Ohio State had better, better, a better receiving room. Uh, that might be the, where you could go. But definitely Michigan had a better offensive line. Michigan had uh, probably just as good. You could probably go push on the defensive line with Ohio State because they don't get a, they don't they didn't really get a lot of pressure um, throughout the season, but they were pretty good. Um, but Michigan probably got more sacks and got more pressure. So you could even go push or give advantage Michigan on the D line. I would even argue that their secondary might be, you could say their secondary in a corner play might be a little bit better than our corner play. Cause we knew Denzel Burke was good. Uh, Igbic Nelson became somebody who I thought really, really stepped into and played really well throughout the season, but you didn't know going into what type of player he was going to be, but we gave up some plays every now and then. So I, you know, across the board, I, running back room, you could say outside of Travion Henderson, Corum, uh, and Edwards definitely Michigan had yeah. the better running back room when you look at talent and they had the, so, and they had the better quarterback. They had the definitely had the better quarterback. quarterback. Yeah, you know, yeah. And that's and that's kind of the thing, right? Like college football goes in cycles, right? Like you right. know, depending on who your quarterback is, you know, I, Ohio State just keeps reloading at receiver. But there's very few programs. I mean, Alabama over the last 10, 15 years, and now Georgia, they're the only ones that never take a step back, right? At all. So right. I just, I just, man, after the game, I guess, I guess I was just a little taken aback at just the pure vitriol from, you know, Buckeye nation here when you went 11 and one. And, you know, I, I just, I, sometimes you just lose to a team that I thought on paper was better than you. 
on the road. You were competitive, one score game. You have the ball down six with a chance to win. I mean, I understand being frustrated, upset, all those things. Of course, you're devastated. But to say to get rid of Ryan Day, like you said, who who are you bringing in? That's going to who bring you in that can you know, do that. Urban Meyer, Meyer, Urban that. Meyer's not Urban Meyer's not coming back there. Like who nope. who are you bringing in? That's going to do any better than that. Like, I, I guess I just, to me, there's always like a, a standard of excellence, but then there's like unrealistic expectations. We've talked about teams like Nebraska or, you know, teams that, that the fan base is just delusional. Like, and, right. and I don't know, it just struck me as, wow, you know, you're still number six. You're still alive for the college football playoff. I just, I, I hate to see a guy's career, you know, uh, players seasons all come down to, one drive in one game that makes the season just a calamity and they all need to go. I just, man, that, that's, I wouldn't want to be a team. I, I wouldn't want to be a fan of that team, I guess. You know, I, I mean, I know you have no you choice. What, but- I, we're, we're just, we're just, we're different. And I think the expectations have changed because you expect Ohio State to be up there, just like people expect Alabama to get there. So what Alabama had three, two or three losses last year. Um, so people yeah. were like, did Bama fall off? Like you just don't expect to see Ohio State have that one loss against Michigan. You figured at some point in time they would figure it out, especially since you were spoiled with Urban Meyer uh, and, and him winning the national championship in 2014 and then him beating Michigan all seven years and seven times that he was there. So you kind of had this expectation, like if you're new or if you're a little younger, you've been a, for 13 years, all you've seen was your your team dominate and win games That's against true. that team up north. So you don't, you don't know anything else. You don't know what it's like when they lost that game in that series, because if you're 13, you've been seeing ever since you're a little kid, like, hey, Ohio State beats them. Ohio State wins this game. And it, and, and and they put up like a 56-pointer a couple in one of those games. So I get it. You don't understand what it's like. And so sometimes you kind of need some a reality check to set in. I, I I don't think the university pulls the trigger and says they're going to get rid of Ryan Day. I, that, that, that would be absurd to me. I think you have a strong conversation. Okay, coach, give me a plan. Like, give me a two-year strategy on what you're going to do to be more competitive. I think you, you can you can make the argument of you lost some guys. You had you had yours that transferred out because you didn't have you had a lot of talent at, at quarterback and he didn't want to sit and wait. So, are you going to go to the portal and try to go get somebody else? Like, give me your plan of what you're trying to do to say I'm going to build a better team to be more competitive against them. And I think a lot of fans are just upset because people are looking like, man, we lost to the interim head coach. Like, you know, yeah. I, again, I don't know if Michigan plays as loose and relaxed if Harbaugh is at the sideline, but they definitely have a different personality um, with their current coach now, with the, with, uh, the, the, the interim coach. We're gonna they see, they, we're they gonna look see it looser. On... Right. We're going to see it Saturday, right? I mean, Harbaugh's back. Yeah. For the Big Ten Championship. And well, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say that is something that well, I mean, they're, 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 Iowa cannot – offensively, Iowa can't stay with, with what Michigan We need to puts. talk if about Michigan that. puts up points, then th- this is not even a question. Now, if Michigan falters and they happen to lose that game, oh, w- now we're talking about chaos, which I guess will be a good segment right. to talk about the, yeah, the let's, rankings uh, that just came out. Let's go. So, uh, you know, the rankings just came out. You would, you would texted me, you know, your predictions ahead of time. And, you know, obviously Georgia number one, that was no surprise. They first half of that game against Georgia Tech kind of went maybe the way you'd expect. Georgia Tech was competitive. And then, you know, Georgia just kind of stepped on their throat. Michigan number two, no surprise. Washington no surprise. number three, boy, another no another kind of thread the needle game for Washington. And I cannot wait, A, to talk about Friday night against Oregon right. and then to watch that game. I'm And I'm, I'm really happy that that game's Friday night. Like that, that right. to me is a, is a nice bonus. I'd forgotten that until I saw the preview this morning and I'm like, Oh, beautiful. Number four, Florida state. Um, they very well could have, and maybe should have lost that game to Florida. If it, for anybody who watched that game, that game flipped, I think late second quarter, early third quarter, one of the Florida D linemen got ejected for spitting, which I had never seen. It actually called spitting. They showed the replay, and he got his money's worth for that 15 yards in the ejection. He spit on a dude. Yeah. It prolonged a drive. Florida State went down and scored and really kind of woke up. And, you know, the backup quarterback mm-hmm. did just enough, just enough to get the ball in his playmaker's hands to win that game. They're vulnerable. And Very boy, I, so. I really – I would like to see them lose just because I don't think that without Jordan Travis, they're one of the four best teams in college football. So I will I will definitely be rooting for them to lose. I don't 
think they do, but it's you know that's not no, out of the you question. Know what? I, again, I, I I would I would argue that depending on which Louisville team shows up, I mean, you could see that loss. I I I don't you know, could. Like, especially Louisville, without Louisville Jordan Travis. Tough. Yeah, without Jordan yeah. Travis, like that's going to be the thing. If they can get after the young quarterback now uh, and get some pressure, which they they're unorthodox. They do a lot of different things on defense. They do some weird things on offense. Like you know, now we know speed. Speed wise, Florida State can match up and, and run with anybody. Uh, but I would say don't sleep on Louisville. Uh, and I, I thought I thought it was kind of one of those trap games. I thought they were coming in looking like we know we're going to the, the ACC championship. And, and they thought they were going to win that game uh, and, and end up getting a close loss uh, last week. But at the end of the day, like, look, um, yeah, we, we need we need. F- well, I won't go and jump ahead. We'll keep we'll, 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 we'll keep, keep we'll keep moving we'll keep here. Number five, number five, Oregon. Obviously, yep, no those surprise two, there. Those two are going to work themselves out, and I feel like Washington, if they lose, will be out. I don't think that there's being number three, and if you lose the rematch to Oregon, I feel like the way they've played the last four or five weeks and all of these kind of escapes and high wire acts for them, I feel like. The winner of that game clearly is in, but I think the lose right. if Oregon loses, they have two losses and they're out. But I think Washington's out as well if they lose. So I think I think you're down to one Pac-12 team under any circumstance. Your Buckeyes are six. The team that kind of got hosed here is Texas uh, yeah. at seven. You know, and now they're playing an Oklahoma State team that should have lost to BYU. I mean, they, they should have lost that game. I watched quite a bit of that game in the rain. They should have lost that game, and, and they they were looking ahead to Texas in a rematch. But, boy, that's going to be tough for Texas, I think, to jump anybody with a win against Oklahoma State. And then Alabama at number eight, and one of the craziest endings that you'll ever see to any football game ever. I was at the sports book at Turning Stone. Uh, it was a scene there. Uh, I didn't think that was coming. I thought Jalen Milrow might take off and try to run into the end zone. I thought that might right. be their best play on fourth and goal from the 31. Boy, he is, he, he reminds me a little bit of Josh Allen in the fact that he can make some of the most spectacular plays in the world. And then some of the most head scratching plays where, you know, on third down, he's over the line of scrimmage by about four yards and then backs up and you're just, it's, he's a high wire act, right? On every play. Yeah. Yeah. He's excited. He's he, he takes he's, chances. Yeah, <laughs> you can't turn it away, but boy, t- talk to me. What, what did the Auburn DB do wrong on that last play? If anything. It's tough, right? Like you're trying to figure out how to play. You don't want to get it. And it's hard to point the fingers because I'm not sure how he's coached, right? There's some people that say, you know, we want you to be even with the, the receiver. You don't want to even get behind you. You want to be able to use the the, the end line and, and do all those things. I mean, but if you're going to front him, you got to make sure the ball can't go over your head. Like he fronted him. Like he literally was playing front coverage in front of the um, receiver, kind of looking up. Uh, again, Milro throws an amazing ball. He, he, he extends it down. He gets out extends it down and now you're like okay shoot is he going to run or is he going to make the throw and he makes an amazing throw he puts it where his only his receiver can catch it and now you're hoping as a defensive back that when he comes down i can either strip it or tip it or do something or get that ball out or push him out and you can't do either of those things and so you lose on a heartbreaking fan a manner and i'm sitting like i i, I don't really know what you can do or, except for coach a little different like listen body him up like get where you need to be like we should be shoulder to shoulder i shouldn't be he shouldn't be behind me where if it's a deep ball he has a better opportunity to make that play than i do Uh, and and that's kind of the only thing i can say is he put himself in a position where he made it a very difficult play on himself and a receiver had a little bit more height made the jump i mean the ball was perfect i mean we can sit up here and talk about perfect passes and and quarterbacks that just drop it where it should be you can't ask for a better a better thrown ball in that scenario in that situation it's not too long it doesn't carry me it's over the defensive back's head only receiver can go up on high point but it doesn't carry him out of the position where he can't get two feet down uh and it was just an amazing throw and i'm sitting there like wow like this you lose a game like this uh, and, and and you just shake your head and say okay that is really what you look at with Milro, the up and down, the inconsistencies. But then that's also why you're like, he gives you the best chance to win. And I don't understand why they benched him a game early yeah. in the season because yeah. he by far, he's young, he's still learning, but he by far is the most dynamic player and playmaker that you have on your offense and the dynamic quarterback that you have in that quarterback room. And so 
he he seemed to settle in during the season and and when a game's on the line he made the right play and and Auburn came up a little short just a little short uh, but was, I didn't think they were going to win that game but I was like Auburn's going to knock them off and and you don't have to worry about Alabama coming in so right. it's going to be interesting on Saturday it was it was ironic that it was the 10 year anniversary of the kick six you know when Auburn returned right. the the field goal 109 yards those games and we talked about that game and how you know it's always more fun when Auburn is good because you know that is Auburn and Alabama kind of reminds me of Ohio State Michigan in the fact that man Auburn was six and five but if they beat Alabama and knock them out of the playoff their season is right, made right. you know like made, everything yeah. was down to that game and Auburn's always kind of the little brother to Alabama and what a what a brutal way to lose like I mean that's that that was that was tough and ironically yeah. that throw you know, and, and how the DB played it was really eerily reminiscent of Sunday when when uh, you know Jalen Hurts threw the one in the back of the end zone that got over Mike Hyde's head, and yeah, you know, it really the, was. the kid made it really. It, I saw that, and I'm like, I just saw this movie yesterday with 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 the with the Jalen Milrow throw. So you know, the Bama Georgia game, I and mean, we've been talking about that for quite a bit of time, and previewing that. You know, you you wonder, you know, Bama's riding high now. Like, what is what what does that feel like? As a player, you escaped. I mean, you escaped, right? Like your season's still alive. You escaped. Now you got to go play, you know, the best team in college football over the last three years in the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. They're going to have, you know, probably a 60-40, you know, home field advantage. Like, right, God, right. What, what a, what a, like, what a ride those guys for Alabama are on. But, you know, is there a letdown possibility there? I know that sounds crazy no. considering it's the SEC championship. But you're not just emotionally exhausted from winning that game, right? You're just you're riding not, the wave. You're not exhausted from that. You're riding the wave. I, I think and I, I think you have to look at it from Alabama's standpoint, right? Like, we're sitting up here talking about you escape. They're talking about, listen, we found a way to win. Like, we, sure. we don't look at it as we escape. We found a way to win against a team that maybe their records didn't say they were – a. a when you look at the 6-5 and five record, like, all right, maybe their record says they're not as good as everyone thinks they are. But this is a rivalry game, so you know they want nothing more than to knock us off and knock us out of being in that college football playoff mention right now. And so when you look at Alabama side of it, their thing was, like, we don't really care. Like, all we have to do is win. If we win and we put ourselves in an opportunity to be still, you go out and you knock off Georgia on you're Saturday, in. like, you're, in. you're going to be in. You're in. And, and that's going to cause some chaos theory. So you're not looking at it as we, we got lucky and we survived. You're going to go back and say, okay, what did Auburn do to us to put us in positions? Um, and how do we overcome? Like, hey, Jalen, um, great throw. We love what you were doing. Jalen, you know, you're four yards past the line of scrimmage. You can't do that, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. You're going to go we back gotta, and go. We got to calm we go. down just a little yep. bit on some of these. He's, you know, again, he's he's the high wire act. He's, he's, yeah. he's five years ago. He's five years ago, Josh Allen, where you can't take your eyes off of him, but you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen, you know? Right. And, and you live you live with that, right? Especially with him. He's a high you variance quarterback. You live with it because, A, it's the best guy you got, but, B, that's your shot to beat Georgia, right? Because because That's your shot because his legs is the one thing that you and George is going to try to be ready. They're going. It's going to be interesting to see how they play. Where they're going to use a spy because then you're going to say, "I like some one-on-one matchups that I, I'm going." To, he's sure. going to try to take advantage of it because he can definitely throw the ball. So that is a very interesting game and one the game that I would definitely be watching the most is watching that game at four on Saturday because that's the first. Well, Friday is the first cast, right? Like if Washington wins, then you already know that Washington's in, right? So that's that's not a question. And then. Right now, Oregon's five, Ohio State's six. So that's one spot that they go down. Uh, we come back and you look at it on Saturday, Texas and Oklahoma State. I, I mean, you know, that's a 50-50 toss-up. Like, I mean, it I'm is. an Oklahoma State fan. Like, I mean, yes, I'm, you I'm, are. A, I'm another OSU fan. Like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a text Thurman to be like, <laughs> yo, I'm an OSU fan today. <laughs> like, there you go. go. And go Cowboys. OSU. Like, go Cowboys. Like, let's go. Uh, and then Georgia, Alabama is the key because if Georgia – and then the question then remains is – because I love chaos theory is – if Alabama knocks off Georgia, where does Georgia fall? <laughs> that that's the question. Is Georgia going four? Right. Obviously, it depends on how the game goes. I can't. A. I don't see a scenario where the where Georgia ever gets blown out. I just right. don't. I don't. They're not. They're not built that way. You know, they're, they're so physical. They can run the ball. You know, they start slow quite a bit. But even if Alabama wins that game, I I don't see any way in the world that they win by. A, a, a margin that would say, oh, wow, you know, Georgia wasn't competitive. We should knock them out. It feels like they have a spot, especially being the two-time defending champ. Man, yep, that's I, I, I feel like they have a spot 
almost no matter what, unless I, I can't even envision a scenario where they're not in. Like you said, you know, when you look at the weekend, it kind of sets up perfectly for you as a, A, as an Ohio State, you know, fan yeah, and a that. chaos lover. The times of these games are great. You know, you, you clearly, you want Oregon to win, right? To, you know, right. But I think because Oregon's already ahead of, of Ohio State, there's almost no way if they beat Washington that they're not still ahead of Ohio State who doesn't even play this weekend. So it feels like the winner of that game is in. It feels like you definitely want, you know, at, at noon, you're absolutely cheering for, you know, Thurman's Cowboys. That That's that's absolutely. the no-brainer. You want Georgia to win. Yep. You got to get you got to get Alabama out of there. Now, what what do you want at eight o'clock? What do you want with the Michigan and Iowa game? Like, like I, and obviously you want Louisville to beat Florida State. That's another no brainer at eight o'clock. Yes, that's a no brainer. Really, really, when I'm looking at it, I want Washington to win. I don't want Oregon to win because then you have another one loss team, and you're sure. trying to trying to figure out where does Washington get ranked? Should Washington be ranked over a house State or not? So I don't want that drama. I want Washington to win because now you have Georgia. You know, Georgia, if Georgia wins. On Saturday, so one Friday, I want Washington to win. Boom, that takes care of Oregon. Oregon is one now, two losses. They're out. Ohio State, in all actuality, before those games are played, will go at one spot. You want Louisville to knock off Florida State for certain. Yep. Um, so I'm definitely a Louisville fan. So I'll be rooting for them. And then, really, you want to see. I, I don't necessarily really. I don't want Alabama to win. Uh, I, no. I I love chaos, but I don't want Alabama to win. I don't want Texas to win because then, because of where they put Ohio State, Texas has two losses now. And then you're going to have if Oregon or Oregon loses. They have two losses. And then because Alabama lost, they have two losses. So by default, Ohio State ends up being back at number four because all the teams that are underneath them have two losses. They don't have their conference championships. Florida State has a loss. They don't have a conference championship. Our strength of schedule based off of how the committees always saw it is better. So that's how Ohio State gets in. You really need Washington to not win Friday, Georgia to win. And then you need everyone else to win, uh, to lose, but you need Michigan to win. You don't really want to see Michigan lose that game uh, because, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Then you make the, then you make it like, do they get ranked ahead of Ohio State because they beat Ohio State, but they lost in the champ. They still have one more win, one more victory than Ohio State has. And that's the argument that you could make. So I need Michigan to win. I, I'm a I'm a Wolverine fan only for one night. <laughs> yeah, you but, night. you know I, you were you were upset after the game, rightfully so, and, and frustrated. And I texted you, and, and I'm like, there's still a path there. And and you know, it seemed apparent to me, even at you know four o'clock on Saturday, that Ohio State, if they're the only one loss team along with Florida State, Ohio State will be four. That's what you need, yes. right? Like, like to yep, break it down, to just you need you need Ohio State and Florida State to have one loss, and you need all the one loss teams this weekend to lose. You need Bama yep. to lose, you need Texas to lose, and you need Oregon to lose. And yes. that's you know that's not crazy. You know, it's it's not likely because there's just so many moving parts, but it's also not crazy. So, and the nice thing for you is that they're all spread out at different times over the weekend. So, I I personally, as as a friend of yours and for our show and. I hope it gets to that Louisville, Florida State game at eight o'clock because uh, it's kind of ironic this year because Louisville was the team that made me the most angry throughout our our right. podcast. Uh, <laughs> you know, knocking off Notre Dame and ending their their it would be it would be it would be kind of karma and kind of interesting if if your season came down to the Louisville Cardinals like. Unfortunately, my Irish season came down to the Louisville Cardinals. And, and you know, obviously, hopefully you'd have a, a better outcome in that game than I did. But the weekend, those two days set up great. They're all compelling matchups. I, I saw yes, something on Twitter. I saw something on Twitter I wanted to share with you and, and the people listening. Do you know what Iowa's team point total is for Saturday night? What's the over-under of Iowa's team points for the game? Uh... uh... Oof. Maybe 17, 13. Iowa, half a point, Marlon. <laughs> In Las Vegas, it is a 50-50 shot that Iowa scores any points on Saturday against Michigan. Which is I think they score points. I think they score points against Michigan. Uh, 100%. I agree. I I'm taking I'm taking their team points over. I think it's kind of crazy in a game like that. You know, their defense is good enough to cause a turnover in plus territory, you know, to get a run back, a, a punt return. It's crazy to me to ever bet a team in a conference championship to get shut out. It's difficult to shut a team out, right. even if it's in garbage time. You know, if Michigan's up 24 nothing and, and they pull their starters on the last drive of the game or, or whatever. So just you know, the whole world is counting Iowa out. Um, I just I, I don't know if the like nobody believes in us thing is going to really matter because I don't think 
that they're explosive enough to keep up with Michigan. Like you said, Michigan's got playmakers and they're going to move the ball even on a good Iowa team. But it's, it is, it is kind of an interesting spot for Michigan, right? There's going to be your coach is back. You've just beat your biggest rival. There's going to be a little bit of a, just a little bit of a lull, right? I wouldn't even call it a letdown, but, but facing Iowa the week after facing Ohio state in the big house is not the same. Definitely not the same. And so you're hoping that there's no letdown uh, on them. You you need them to go out and take care of business. Um, I think I think the first quarter they could start slow. And I think Iowa, I could see Iowa keeping it like 0-0 or 3-0 or even a 7-0 into the first quarter. Uh, it all comes down to w- two things. One, can Michigan run the ball? If they can run the ball against that Iowa defense, then that's going to make play action really good for them. And then off of that, if they can run the ball, then can J.J. McCarthy make the right decisions off that play action? Can he hit the open receivers? If it gets, if they can't run the ball and they rely on his arm, will he be the J.J. McCarthy that threw the, the threaded needle pass um, for a touchdown against the Buckeyes? Or will he be the J.J. McCarthy against Bowling Green where he threw like three or four interceptions earlier in the season? So that's where you really need to be able to run the ball if you're Michigan because you don't want all the pressure to be placed on J.J. McCarthy and say, okay, I need you to go and just play mistake-free football because then you make it so that Iowa can keep it in. They they can they, they will get turnovers. Like, they're scrappy defense. They they tip passes. And in that scenario, I, I'm not sure. With Harbaugh back, that's the question. I want to see how they play with Harbaugh back at the helm. Do they play as loose as they played against Ohio State? Or do they play a little bit more tight? Like, if it's 7-10-3 at the half or 10-7 at the half, is it a tight Michigan team? Um, do they just try to play – play that old trestle ball back in the day or play Penn state football where they just, we're going to rely on our defense and punt. That's what I was done all year. And they've been pretty successful and they know how to execute that down the stretch. And so that would be the anatomy of a makeup if they can't run the ball. But I don't, I, I think with their two running backs, I think Michigan should be able to win this game. And Michigan should, I, I would say something like a 45, 10 victory. Yeah. Michigan it's, would have on there. As soon they as, play, come focus. As, as soon as I was down two scores, it's over. It's right? over. They just, it's they over. Can't. They're not built for they, that. They're not built for it. They can't, they can't adjust. They've shown that all year. Like they can only play one way and it's right. successful in the big 10 West when you're playing, you know, Illinois and Wisconsin and teams that can't wait to punt the ball right back to you, you know? So, but, but against a team like Michigan and Ohio state that want to score, you know, and actually want to put points on the board. If you're down 17 to three, something like that, you're, you're, you're probably toast. So that's almost the least compelling of the games to me. This weekend, you know, like it feels like Michigan's kind of in either way, unless something catastrophic happens. So that's it's almost the game that I'm looking forward to the least because the stakes, you know, because Iowa just doesn't feel like a credible, you know, knock uh, you know, upset contender. I just, I just, right. I can see Louisville. Louisville is, is a live dog, especially with Jordan Travis out. Louisville would have been a live dog anyways because of their you know yes. unique style, and and you know, but Iowa just. Iowa just doesn't seem like a live dog to me at all. I just, I, I that, nope. that one will, that one will not be on the big screen. I'll have Louisville, Florida state on. And if Ohio state still has a shot, I promise you, I will cheer for Louisville. If Louisville, if, if Ohio state is, is, does not have a shot, I, I will root against Louisville because they right. just, they, yeah, they, they aggravated me. I don't know. Did you see any of the, um, the Notre Dame game on Saturday? Probably not. No, I was Pac-12 I was, network. I was wallowing. Uh, I understand. Audrey Gastame had 245 yards rushing. And I actually just. Where was that? It. Where was that all season? No kidding. And no, no. And they kept feeding them the ball. And it was actually interesting in the fourth quarter. They're up big. And Marcus Freeman asked him if he wanted to go back in the game because he was five yards away from the Notre Dame all time rushing record for a single game. And he declined. He did. He declined. And the game was out of hand. I mean, they were up, I think, right. it's, you know, 55 14, whatever. And I actually, I actually admired that. I thought that was really kind of classy by I him. I respect that. You know, and, and he was five yards away, and they all knew it. And you know, the single the single game rushing record in Notre Dame is it's a big deal. You know, that's that's a that's a that's yeah. a nice record to have. And he he declined that. And there's kind of some talk about whether he's going to go to the NFL or he might come back to Notre Dame next year. Personally, I hope he comes back. Obviously, but you know, they closed the season on kind of a high note. Stanford is just terrible, and there weren't more than like twenty thousand people at that game. It's just you know the environment there was yeah. bad. Now. I don't know if you saw any of the bowl projections and sometimes, you know, these are kind of all over the place, whatever, all the different bowl games, my buddy, Pat, who's a big Syracuse fan. I watched the game with him 
uh, Syracuse beat Wake Forest with an interim coach to get to six and six. And now they're going to go to like the Birmingham Bowl or the Motor City Bowl or one of these, you know, nondescript bowls. Almost all of the experts, Marlon, have Notre Dame playing in the, the Reliaquist Bowl, which is the old Citrus Bowl in Orlando against our old friend Brian Kelly and the LSU Tigers. I would love day, that. I would love that matchup. Yes, it's got to be. You know, and it's funny because they're <laughs> they're talking about how the Bulls can kind of trade teams. You know, they have these like kind of loose slots for conferences, and it's supposed to be ACC versus SEC, and where you where you finish in the standings determines who you play. Like the third ranked team in the ACC is supposed to play the third ranked team in the SEC, you know, and down the line. Well, I guess there's some horse trading going on and some bargaining, and I think the powers that be in college football want. Notre Dame versus LSU. The crazy thing is, is that both quarterbacks might not play. That's true. That you know, I mean, if you're G, if you're Jaden Daniels, I don't see why you'd play in this game. And then if There's you're Sam league. Hartman, you There's know, no if you're, yeah. he has no need. He's going to probably win the Heisman. I don't know why you'd play. If you're Sam Hartman, you've played college football for like 138 years now. And, you know, I don't know whether you, you know, his pro prospects is probably a mid-level pick, right? Like a mid-round right. pick, back, career backup. I don't know if you're going to play in that game. But the theater at like 11 a.m. on New Year's Day of Marcus Freeman against Brian Kelly, you got to make it happen, right? I, I want to see that. Right. And how funny that Marcus. That, that would and be how funny, so perfect. It's yep. So and how funny that see. how funny that Brian Kelly left Notre Dame because he said that they didn't have the commitment to win national championships like LSU did, and now he's going to end up playing Notre Dame in the same bowl game because his team went nine and three too. Exactly, and, and and you can't you can't write a better story. And the irony of all that, and and I I think in the long run. Notre Dame is probably in a better position. Uh, I mean, LSU was in the SEC, and and having the the gauntlet that you have to run with every week to try to knock off those teams, I don't know if his coaching style is, is going to lend itself to being able to say they're always they're going to go undefeated because you pretty much have to go undefeated. Yeah, uh, and and you can't have a, you can't have a loss in conference. You can have a loss out of conference, just like Alabama had one loss against Texas. You can have that loss. But you can't lose one in, in conference. And so I don't know if he ever gets to – yeah, LSU is committed to trying to win a national championship 100%, but so is Notre Dame. So to make that statement, just say you want it out. Just say they yep, didn't, yep. they weren't listening to me anymore and 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 the, and the level of athlete that I'm getting here just isn't responding to my coaching style and, and the way I and way I communicate to athletes. You can say that, and I would respect that more than saying they're not committed to winning. Like, obviously yeah. they're committed to winning. So it's interesting. I, I, I'm definitely and, – and if that plays out, I'm taking Notre Dame. You don't have to worry about it. I'm 100% in. I'm, there you I'm go. Good man. Down, Good man. And I want to see them beat the brakes off of Brian Kelly. I think – I think you know, the funny thing is is that Brian Kelly went 9-3 and three with, with the presumptive Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback. Like, he has the Heisman Trophy winner, and you still lost three games. Good luck right. to you going forward. You're not going to get a better quarterback at LSU than Jaden Daniels has been. Like, you're just nope. not. He is dynamic. He's fantastic. He's played his ass off all year long. And I, if you can't, if you can't be a credible threat and you end up playing your, your old school who wasn't committed to winning, when you have the Heisman Trophy winner as your quarterback, Good luck to you going forward. I, I don't I don't see it for old BK down there. And 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 I, I agree with you. I hope Notre Dame just kind of you know runs all over them if if it comes to that game. Because I mean, Marcus, yes. Marcus will have his guys, whoever is playing in that game. It, it it'll be personal for some of those guys because Brian Kelly only left two years ago. So he still left right. some of those guys. Oh yeah, they like know they they want they would they would love that matchup. I would I mean you can't write a better story. Yeah, like you can't. You can't write a better couple, story for that to happen. Couple more, a uh, couple more quick ones before we uh, before we go here. Did you see who is getting hired as the new offensive coordinator at Arkansas? Bobby Petrino. Oh my goodness. Okay, so a couple things here. Bobby Petrino's history is checkered at best. Uh, checkered yeah. at best. So the head coach there is is under Sam Sam Altman is under a lot. He's on the hot seat, and Bobby Petrino mm -hmm. feels like a desperation hire on his behalf, but it also feels like you're hiring your replacement, you know, because it, 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 it Bobby Petrino is a kind of a head coach in waiting and the kind of guy who might shank you to the administration. If you go on a three game losing streak and Arkansas is a tough place to win to begin with, but man, sure. I, I, I just, I feel like if I'm a head coach and I'm to the point where I need to hire Bobby Petrino as my OC, eh, that's a tough spot, right? 
that's a tough spot. And 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 the checker pass is really what kind of like lays it like you you couldn't find somebody else with less less baggage coming in. Like and and, and as the age of where he is, how is he going to relate to this younger generation? Can he? Will he? Will they listen to him? And if it goes sideways quick, like that, that says, okay, listen, like this is one of those hires where you, you have to think like either it better win and you better, it better work out and you guys better win and you better turn it around. You better put up a lot of points or that could be one of those hires that gets both of you kicked out of there really quickly. Uh, kind right. of like one of those, those Ryan Ryan hires, right? Like, Hey, like, you know, you might get a chance, but you brought in somebody else and all of a sudden it, it goes sideways. Well, you, both of you need to go because you, and, you, you said it was going to work and it didn't work. And, and he has the potential to blow it up off the field too. You know, not just yeah. his coaching, but he clearly has some <laughs> self-control issues and, and baggage to where you wonder if he even makes it to the season. And, and like you said, boy, why are you bringing in like a, a retread of a failed, you know, I, I, I'm sure he's got a great offensive mind, but who's, what what young kid is going to go play for Arkansas if they've got a bunch of other options and excited to play for sixty five year old Bobby Petrino? Like I just I I if 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 I was if I was the mom, the, the the dad of a, of a you know seventeen year old Marlin, no way. Sorry, buddy, you're not playing for Bobby Petrino. Like I, you know you just you know I just I just I wouldn't you want my kid around questions. him. That's why you ask questions. Like listen, like hey, if I have other options, I may consider taking other options. But if I if this is the only option I have. Then okay, well, what type of offense are we running? Like Bobby Petrino's been out for a while. Like, he, did he have some decent offenses in the past? Yes. I mean, now could he have revamped his entire offensive philosophy and said, "Here's what I think we should do"? And is he going to be more aggressive because because of his age and saying, "Look, where we are, we need to take more chances." Could be, but when you take risk, there's also a, a high risk means high loss too. So high risk is high reward, and high risk is high loss too. Like you, it could go the other way. So that's kind of one of those decisions where. Look, he already made the decision. He's bringing him in uh, and whatever capacity that's going to look like, unless the board of trustees overrides it and says, no, we're not doing that. Um, but as it stands now, it's been reported on it. He's coming in yeah, now. Man. The Let's SEC, see how it translates. I don't know some, how it translates. Some of these SEC schools, you know, the, 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 the lower tier, boy, sometimes they strike you as really desperate, right? Like that just feels like a desperate hire. And, and if you're Arkansas and you're stuck in the SEC West with Alabama, and with Auburn and Old Miss and LSU and now Texas coming in, like I can see why you're desperate to a point. Yeah. But boy, selling your soul for a guy like him to me is a tough look. And I'd almost rather not win than win with that dude. I that's just you know <laughs> that's just my well, take. But I know we all, it's we college all football. Love a good redemption. Like we love a good redemption story, no matter what, whether whatever level it is, we love a good redemption story. So if he has said, you know, hey, listen, I made some mistakes. I know that I own them. I've never heard him say I was, you know, it was somebody else's fault. He's always owned up to his mistakes and said, you know, I've, I've not been I've not made good decisions. But, you know, so you want to listen to the man and, and see what he says. And then if it turns out that they go in and they go on a great roll, it's a great story. It sells a lot of tickets. It does a whole lot of things. It makes them the darling of the SEC. It it makes boosters happy. So at this point, I mean. You know, we talked about Ryan Day. Who else could you get? Like, who else is going to take that job? I think that's kind of the question that you have when you say when you look at a, a Bobby Petrino coming back and you're saying, OK, listen, you don't think he's talked to other people and said, hey, I need a good offensive mind. You know, would you be willing to take it? Some guys were like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stay where I am. I'm, I'm in a yeah. better position to go there. So it may have been just some of the other people that he inquired about said, no, I've got a good gig. I'm saying here. And Bobby Petrino's like, well, he's almost he's almost a lame duck. Sam yeah. at, at, at Arkansas, he's in trouble. And you're right. Yeah, like, he's in like, trouble. And, 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 and he turns it around. He's, he keeps his job. If he doesn't, they're both out. Yeah. No, so, that's, that's no fair. harm, no foul. One more for you here. I, I posted it on our Twitter account. I retweeted it. Did you happen to see Mike Elko went from Duke to Texas A&M? And Texas A&M, I, I think, is the strangest place in all of college football and maybe in all of America. Did you see the press conference? When they did the whole swaying they're back in and forth, big circle and and the, they're like, I'm like I, that's weird. I'm, I don't know what that is. I, that, that's, that's a weird ass them. place. That is a know weird. That is. That's a weird place. Did you did you ever play with anybody? Are you friends with anybody who went there? Yeah, I knew some guys who went there, but we didn't talk too much about uh, their experience in <laughs> Texas. You know, just kind of like look. It seems like what I a weird place. Texas A&M, okay, I'm good. I, I I will have to ask like what that that. Uh, that whole Swain circle thing was and, and why, kind, you and know, why that's a tradition. I, I hate to bring it up. It, it reminds me of a cult. 
You know, they got that midnight, that midnight yell practice and just all the weird little things they do there. And, and then to introduce your coach. And I mean, he must have known that was coming. And with the bag of money they gave him, you know, hey, I'll sway in front of a camera for $50 million or whatever it is. But I don't know. It just just strikes me. It's such a weird place. I, I just I don't know. It's weird. Hey, look, everyone has their traditions. You try to buy into it and show that you're, you know, hey, I'm 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 all in, but yeah, I don't. I mean, the paycheck is nice, and the buyout clause is really nice. So sure, yeah, sure. I'm staying there. I'm staying right there. I'm good. All right. Any uh, any final thoughts for us before uh, before you go back in the bunker for Friday and Saturday? <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just. I, I wish I I could see chaos, <laughs> but chaos is not good for my Buckeyes. So I really just want to see it play out um, with. Washington winning and Florida State losing. I, I think that is, uh, as Buckeye fans, that is the best case scenario for the Buckeyes to then get back in. Washington needs to win. Florida State needs to lose. And Buckeyes Oklahoma lose. and Oklahoma State needs. And Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Yes, yeah, and Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State wins. Alabama loses. Uh, and then our Buckeyes are there. So uh, anything else, then we're sitting outside and looking and we're playing Louisville or somebody else. Um, and, and, and and if Washington loses, I could see them trying to see if the Buckeyes um, will play Washington. That'd be a fun one of those both games, depending on how it plays out. So that would be a fun matchup. Uh, but outside of that, I'm just, you know, thankful um, that everyone listened to us and we got to talk about Buckeye football. And and we're going to talk about some of these bowl matchups as they play out. But I, I'm sorry we came up three years short in a row. Yeah, Buckeye fans. Well, and we're just going to go back and reload and figure out what it looks like going forward. I'm always going to stick and and bleed scarlet and gray and i am not one calling for ryan day's job uh, but i definitely need to re we need to revamp some things and figure out why um you know why things happen uh, and then hopefully they get back onto the winning things and the winning side with, with the game at the horseshoe um, in 2024 so you know great season um they had some some good things and and some young players but you know, quarterback play definitely um, was a liability at times, and you need to figure out why. Um, and, and the development of that young player, is, is there somebody else that needs to be a different voice to help him mature faster? There's still a path, Marlon. Till next week, I'm going to leave you with that. There's there a path, still, I believe. I believe. Hence, there is still, there is still, and you know, and yet that, that same, that same, um, that same mantra could be applied to other football teams that we know. There is still yeah, a path. where we live at in Buffalo. There's, there's, <laughs> we still believe here too. I believe there, here too. <laughs> there's still a path. All right, we'll see you next week, buddy. See you next week.